Hey, what's going on, everybody? I'm Blake from Allsmith, and you're watching Founder and Lawyer Walk Into a Bar. It's a show where we ask lawyers to explain the nitty gritty legal stuff for startups with one big catch. Every time that he introduces a new legal term, we both have to take a drink. Today we welcome David Wilbrand. He's a partner at Thompson & Hine, and he's focusing on venture capital and emerging companies. In addition to being an all-around good dude, he's a Harvard graduate, he's a former startup CFO, and he teaches entrepreneurial law at University of Michigan. Welcome to the show, David Wilbrand. Thank you again for doing this. Really excited to do it. There are two main reasons I wanted to do this. Uh, one is because uh, I think it's really, uh, there are a lot of questions that founders have that have to do with legal stuff, yeah. and it makes a huge difference later on, and I think sometimes we uh, delay talking to a lawyer, mm -hmm. and so sometimes don't get these answers until it's too late. Mm -hmm. um, two is I also kind of wanted to illustrate the concept of like, when we sold Cladwell, the last phone call I had uh, as CEO of Cladwell was to you, yeah. and we had like a very like memory focused and philosophically oriented conversation. And I feel like the relationship between the founder and between the lawyer is a really unique relationship. And I think especially so outside of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. um, that, I don't know, it's like a really cool relationship where you can, you can talk straight to the founder in a way that maybe the board or even employees or other people can't really talk to it. And I kind of wanted to illustrate that this is like a cool convivial um, relationship. Right. And so that's the, the definition of convivial being to drink, you know, viv, uh, con together. <laughs> So that's what we're doing here. So we cheers. We got Latin real quick. Yeah. Cheers. Very happy to get into this. Thank so. you. Yeah. Cool. All right. So I think we can just kind of jump into it. Um, let's first off. Uh, okay. So first topic to talk about is company formation. Yep. Okay. So um, generally what happens. So as a founder, I'm sitting here. Maybe I have an idea. I got some friends. We're starting to work on something. And at some point we start to realize, okay, we probably need to make a company. And so typically what we'll do is we Google how to form a company, and you're presented very quickly with kind of two different paths. One is called a C-Corp, um, and the other is called uh, an LLC. Yep. Um, and so uh, we're trying to figure out like which path do I take, and it suddenly starts to feel a little bit confusing. So maybe uh, two questions to start us off. One, when is the point where you should form into a company? Mm -hmm. um, and two, what, which direction, which path should we take? Um, also, I'm going to pause right now, and there's one more dimension to this conversation, okay. which is that as a lawyer, you love terms. There's always new terms coming out. Okay. Every time you introduce a new term, we have to take a swig of our drink. So this is both YouTube show slash drinking game, All right. just to kind of keep it interesting. This is going to be drunken law real quick. Exactly. <laughs> right. It's just jargon 24 /7. Yes. Yeah. So every time yes. you introduce a new term, we have to drink something. So. I get it. Yeah. All right. So let's, um, let's, start with the, let's start with our first term. Okay. Limited liability. Limited liability. Cheers, Cheers. to that. All right. Okay. What is limited drink. liability? Right. Well, I raise it because, so I have these conversations nearly every day, okay. multiple times a week with founders or entrepreneurs or quasi founders about mm -hmm. starting a company. And a lot of times founders approach a lawyer for the first time because they've read about something or they've heard about something about limited liability and they feel like they, they need it okay, or they want it. Yes. Right. Which seems right. It's limited and it relates to liability. Yeah, liability bad. You don't want a lot of liability. So, li let's, li so let's, let's limit it. that. Exactly. Yeah. What, what I would say is that, and the counsel I usually give back is that limited liability really important and we don't need to spend a ton of time on it um, but it's not the highest priority for founders like this for companies like this i mean if you're telling me that you're starting a radioactive waste dump mm -hmm. let's talk about limited liability and talk about it right now right mm -hmm. but if you're just starting an app company if you're just starting a life sciences company if you're starting an iot company whatever it's a lot of jargon yeah <laughs> um you know if it's just your basic run of the mill startup you're probably not going to run into true liability issues okay. for a and long time. Liability being like legal risk. Somebody legal risk. You. Legal risk. So yes. you know there are two basic types of liability: contractual liability. Okay. I sign a contract. Mm -hmm. I commit to do something. I don't do it. Term. All right. Someone term. comes back right. later and they say <laughs> you breach that contract. Mm -hmm. You've got to fulfill it. Um, you can get some protection there. Okay. If the party to the contract is the company. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I sign a contract, but yeah. it's my company. You can only come after my company. I can't come you can't you come after person. me as a and person. That's what, I think that's the fear, right? That's right. That's right. Okay. That's right. So that's legitimate, mm -hmm. and that's you know something to be thoughtful about, and that's why limited liability is attractive. 
The other kind is, here's a good one, tort. Not the food, okay. but it, a tort is when somebody is damaged or harmed. That's the other kind of okay. liability. I punch you. Okay. All right. right. That's a tort. Okay. Um, okay. You have to keep up with this. I have to keep You're up. Right. Terms, right. That's why I'm going to try to talk yeah. and keep ahead of it. Um, that's not much of an issue okay. with companies like this and cases like that. Slip and fall, but, like whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But there's some protections associated with that. That being said, you want to have limited liability. It's a good thing to have. It's why we don't do some different types of entities. Okay. Without getting into it, there's one called a general partnership. Mm -hmm. General partnership's really easy. You just form it because we say we want to form it. Okay. It's there. Now but we're a general no, partnership. No but protection. it's unlimited liability. Okay. That's why you're never gonna find a website that's gonna say, hey founders, go ahead and form a general partnership. Got it. A limited liability company, mm -hmm. an LLC, has limited liability in the okay. name. You know it's got limited liability. Yes. A corporation was created originally to provide limited liability. Okay. So it's got limited liability. Okay. So the whole point being, a lot of times people come and they say, I need an entity because I want limited liability. That's the main reason people do it? I, it, it half the time. Is that the right reason to start? To, no. When, when's the right point to pull the trigger no, the, and saying, oh, this is a project, we're totally. building an app to say like, we have to build an entity. When's yep. the right time to do that? Yep. And, and I think what, what you're looking for as a founder or founders is it, it's, you want this entity to do two things for you and they tend to coalesce at the same point in time. Okay. Okay. Number one is we need a common basket where all this IP lives. Okay. We don't want to be in a situation IP where meaning. intellectual property, cheers. Okay. So okay. things you develop, it needs to, now that we're making something together, it has to live somewhere. Otherwise there's gonna be a fight about who yep. made it. And let's, um, two seconds on intellectual property. Most people have heard of patents. Mm -hmm. Most people have heard of copyrights. Mm -hmm. Most people have heard of trademarks. Yep. Um, that's sort of hard IP. That's yes. how some people refer to it. But know-how, ideas, yeah. you know, things strategies that you're kicking around, or, yeah. strategies. Okay. You know, those are, that's intellectual property mm -hmm. too. And, you know, at the beginning stages when you and I are just sitting at a bar and we're thinking about this company or in your living room or wherever, um, it's not that big a deal yet. It's not yeah. really ripened into something. But once we start to do work, mm -hmm. like maybe it's a, a something that you and I and someone else are starting, yeah. you don't want the intellectual property to be scattered among the three of us. Yeah. Because what happens if you leave? But I want to keep working on this with this other person. Mm -hmm. Well, you're going to walk out with whatever intellectual property you develop. Yeah. Unless we've created a company. A bucket a to hold A bucket it. Okay. that we've each agreed to put the intellectual property in. So, so now, it, yeah. now it contains it. Can you talk a little bit more specifically about, I mean, so when, how do you define work? I guess, how do you know work when you see it? Yeah, I, you know, it's, when you get beyond, it's, it's interesting, it is one of those things where to know it when you see it. Yeah. It tends not to be controversial, there tends not to be, boy, we need to make a decision about this, but it, when it, it's when it feels real. Okay. You know, it, it's sort of like, we all know people who always talk about, you know, at the barbecue, they're like, I had the idea about MySpace before MySpace had mm -hmm. it, and I had the idea for Instagram before Instagram had it, and I right. had the idea. No, you didn't. Or right. maybe you did, but you never did anything with yes. it. Those people are always going to talk. They're always going to, you know, they're hype machines. Mm -hmm. They're never going to do anything. Yeah. But you do have groups of people that then start to say, hey, let's pursue this. Yeah. You know, let's get together and let's like maybe say, um, okay, I need you to work on this piece and I need you to work on this piece and I'm going to work on this piece and let's get together in two weeks and let's see what we've got. Yeah. And that, such, that's the point. That's the point where you, want it, where you want to cross the threshold and, you're, and you need to think about it. And related to that is the second piece that I mentioned. So not only do we want a bucket that holds all the intellectual property, okay. we need to talk about ownership. Yes. Who gets how right. much Divvy of up it. the pie. Right. Okay. Right. Because right now when it's just loose, Maybe it's a third, a third, a third. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not because one person is doing more of it, so maybe they can make an argument. Or both of us think each of us should own 60 40. Exactly. Like I should have 60, you don't you want 60, that ambiguity right. at all. Yep. So, limited liability, yeah, it's great, but put that to the side. Okay. What you're really focused on is when have we reached a point where we're actually working on something? Yes. We want a bucket to put it in so mm -hmm. we know it's all in one place. And then we also have to divvy it and up. And we have to divvy it okay. up. You know, yep. how much, who gets what? Okay. That's the moment. Interesting. That's the moment. I've always heard that you should do it once you're either going to start spending money or receiving money. Like that's the, that's the point. But I think that that's at moments that, that yours sounds earlier than that. It, it can be a little earlier and I'm not, you know, 
it, this is, it's sort of an existential experience. Yeah. So, you know, for some people, maybe it is the spending money piece. Mm -hmm. The sensitivity that I have is I don't want people to start the company, form the company too early because it's dynamic. Yeah. And you can have people coming in and out and it's okay to let that breathe a little bit, yeah. you know, at the very earliest stages. Yeah. But there does come a point where we need to get aligned around we're doing this. Yes. So we want all of our IP in one common bucket. No, we don't want any flight risk around here that someone's going to run off and go do it with somebody else. Yes. And we also want clarity around who owns what. Hmm. We don't want that situation where you say you own 60%, I say I own 60%, yes. and this person says they own 60%. Hmm. Because that math doesn't work very well. Right. Right? Yep. And so it, you've got to have enough so that you can have a conversation that's grounded mm -hmm. around ownership. So it's not the three of us met for coffee at Panera. Right. We had a 45 minute conversation. Let's talk about ownership. No, right. you're not there yet. Mm -hmm. But you've taken a couple of steps. Maybe one person has fallen out. Two more people have come in. It's like, this feels like a thing. There's starting to be a thing. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So we've, I think that's helpful. Maybe one more question on that. Mm -hmm. Do you more often see people who form too late or people who form too early? That's a really good question. Um, I, let me answer it. I'll be a lawyer, so I'll say it depends, and I'll parse it. Of course. Yes. Yeah. I will say most people. You also have to drink every time you say it depends. It depends yeah. and parse. So um, I don't run into too many cases where I feel like somebody started it too early or too late. I think people have good instincts around that. Really? Okay. But where I do see I do see problems is people almost always wait too long to have the ownership conversation. Yeah. So they will form the entity, but they won't handle the ownership issue. And so the person, pretty much the person who formed it is the one. Sort of, maybe. Kind of. Kind yeah. of. You know, and it's, okay. so something sparked or spurred them to form it. Maybe they felt like. So that's like, less of the issue. Yeah. But it's more having that conversation. And you know, forming a company is easy. Yeah. You know, you just, you download the form off the state's website, mm -hmm. fill it out, send it in, hundred bucks, yeah. whatever, you're done. And, uh, but then, but there's more that has to go around it to have, to be fully organized. Yeah. And that's part of that. And most people don't do that. Part. Ownership. And that's, they wait too long. Hmm. Okay. And, um, and that's when it can get really sticky okay. and the conversations can get hard. And that's like, I mean, obviously we're doing with boilerplate. Right. Is actually trying to solve that specifically. That's right. Uh, shameless plug. But yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think that, that that's right. Because yeah. It actually forces that on onboarding yep. is who's, who's a part of this and who owns what. So. Yeah. Okay. So talk about LLC versus C Corp. Sure, sure. So I would start by saying there's no wrong answer. Really? Okay. Yes. I would definitely say there's a wrong answer. Okay. But it oh, depends. Look yeah. at you. Okay, go oh, ahead. look at you, lawyer yeah. guy. Yeah. It depends. <laughs> yeah. um, and the reason I say that is because, I, you know, there's a – founders tend to be curious. And founders tend to want to exhaustively understand something to make a good decision. Mm -hmm. Because founders – and this runs against um, what people sort of – uh, think about this stereotypically, founders for the most part try to minimize risk, mm -hmm. which makes all the sense in the world because you're doing the riskiest thing. Yes. So everything else related to it, you want to minimize the risk. Yes. And one of the ways that you minimize risk is really understanding it. Hmm. You don't just sort of jump off a cliff and say, yeah, whatever. Well, mm -hmm. you know, you, you want to understand what's, what am I jumping into? What am I getting into? And it is, it happens all the time where I get on the phone with somebody and they start to just lecture me on LLCs versus C corporations. Really? Yes. They lecture because, you. Yes, because they've done so much work. They say, mm -hmm. "Well, I think I should be an LLC because of this bullet point, this bullet point, this bullet point, this bullet point." Because compared to a C corporate, you know. Yes. And I just sort of let them go. Yeah. You know, let it You're unroll. But they've done a lot yeah. of work. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and they've thought about it a lot. And, and the reason that I start by saying you can't make a bad decision is I just want to lighten the pressure up a little mm -hmm. bit because I think people feel like that it is like this one of these things where if they decide to be an LLC and they should have been a C Corp, it's catastrophic. Right, right. Like it is just, you, you would have built a billion dollar company mm. and instead it's just pocket This is lights. not an irreversible decision. Exactly. You mm. can always, you know, fix mm. it later, change it later, do what you need to do. Unlike the equity decision, which is much harder to reverse. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Um, with that being said, you know, I tend to have a pretty hard bias for C Corporations. Okay. Um, to be even more specific, corporations are formed under state law. You mm -hmm. hear Delaware talked about a lot. Yeah. So people will form a Delaware corporation 
And then that C designation is that's a tax designation. So okay. you can be a C corporation or an S corporation. Okay. Um, lots of pros and cons that we don't need to get into, but for the most part, the types of companies that we interact with don't work so well as S corporations, primarily because you can only have individual human beings be stockholders. Okay. And a lot so of you companies. Can't have investors in an S corporation. Exactly. Okay. It doesn't work well because most investors like to come in through an entity. Okay. Talk about what is a C corp. Mm -hmm. And what is an LLC? Because I feel like that's the that's the division between the two. And that's the and that is the division. Two? So yeah. you sort of you can sort kind of like I, I mentioned general partnerships earlier. Knock yeah, those out. That. S corporations knock those out. Okay. You know primarily because of that restriction on the types of stockholders, and there are other restrictions that get in the way. So it's really C corporation versus LLC. Okay. And the the great thing about an LLC particularly one that elects to be taxed as a partnership, which is what they generally elect to be taxed as, is there's something called a pass-through entity. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. cheers. Yep. So a pass-through entity means it's a tax issue. And it means that the entity itself doesn't really exist as a tax-paying entity. Okay. I'm oversimplifying it. It doesn't, but nothing pay, happens. it doesn't pay taxes. It doesn't pay taxes. It just all trickles up to it all trickles the partners. Up. Right. Okay. And so... And this one, as a founder, as soon as it's like, this is not only legal, but it's also tax-oriented, I think my eyes start to glaze. Totally. Like, oh, no. This totally. Is gonna, yeah. And, and the reason why, you know, people would hear that and they say, okay, wait a minute. So the entity isn't paying taxes or isn't involved in this sort of tax scheme. Instead, it all gets pushed back to the owners. Okay. That sounds bad. Why would the owners want to pay tax? This right. seems like a bad thing. Well, the reason why this is actually a good thing is that in the early days, the company's probably losing money. Mm -hmm. And so instead of those losses belonging to the company, the losses come back to the owners. So if you made, if you made money, it goes against the money you made, That's so you right. have to pay taxes. That's personally. exactly right. And you okay. can use it, it can be highly beneficial. Hmm. And it is, it can be very attractive from that perspective to be an LLC, particularly in the early years when mm -hmm. you're losing money. Some of these companies always lose money mm -hmm. until they sell, you know, losing, losing, losing. And so, so you, and then you personally never have to pay taxes. Exactly. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean it, so that can be, that can be really attractive with a C corporation. It doesn't work like that. Okay. The C corporation, you is know, is that the distinguishing feature between the C corp and the LLC? It is a, it's a big distinguishing feature between okay. the two. Um, C corporations have what's called double taxation. That doesn't sound good at all. It doesn't sound good at all. Mm -hmm. So this isn't an issue so much for the losses part, but on the profits part, it can come into play where the okay. corporation has to pay taxes and then whatever's left, it pushes out to the owners and then the owners have to pay taxes. Got it. So the company makes money and it gets taxed for that profit. Yep. And then it wants to distribute that profit to the investors or to the individuals, and then we get taxed again. That's right. And that doesn't sound very good at That's all. That's right. So my default would be I'd like to rather just have the LLC and have it just come straight out and I only yep. get taxed one time. Yeah. Why is that not always the case? No, and we can and and that sort of generalization of pass through taxation versus double taxation is, you know, at a high level works. And so mm -hmm. you hear that and you're like Give me the pass-through piece. Yep. As That's an LLC, why I, mean, I get losses. Mm -hmm. And then even when we start to get to a profitable place, or maybe when we sell the company, it's only one level of taxation mm -hmm. rather than the C-Corp thing where I don't get to use losses, and it's two levels of taxation. Yeah. Why would I ever want to be a C-Corporation, right. um, given that? The other piece that, to layer on this that people tend to talk about with LLCs is there's a notion that LLCs are more flexible. Mm. That C-Corporations have you know, they have officers, they have a board, they have stockholders, you're supposed to have meetings. There's a sense that there's more formality there. Mm -hmm. LLCs don't have to have that. Okay. Um, they're what we call creatures of contract. Mm -hmm. Whatever you and I want it to be, we can we make it be. Yeah, okay. it's a whiteboard. And you can design the governance structure to fit what you want it to design mm -hmm. or what you want it to fit. And that can be attractive to a lot of people. So that's the LLC argument. Okay. And a lot of people will come to the table and say that. Um, pass through taxation, good. Double taxation, bad. Right. Flexibility, good. Not flexibility, bad. No brainer, right? Right. And a lot of us work that way for a long time, in fact, you know, um, believing, believing that logic. A couple things have happened. Um, one thing with C corporations that's really attractive, and not to get too deep into this tax well, mm -hmm. but there's something called Section 1202. Don't drink too deeply. Mm -hmm. Qualified small business stock. Oh no, what? Okay. Yeah. 
Acronym QSBS. Oh no. Yep. I'm gonna need some more. Simplified. If you hold qualified small business stock, which virtually every startup company's stock is. Okay. If you hold it for over five years, mm -hmm. you pay no tax when you sell that stock. It's a huge incentive for it's investors. A huge incentive. Yeah. And that's not the case with LLCs and for founders. Okay. Oh, for founders too. Interesting. Yes. Mm. yes. So you have to so hold it for five years. You have to hold it for five years. Okay. Now, so if you're an investor or a founder in a in a C corp, correct, then you don't have to pay taxes after five years. Um, that's a big deal. That's okay. a big deal, mm. and that doesn't apply to LLCs. Okay. And the so one point for C corp. That's right. Taxes. And yeah. a lot of people will argue that that tax benefit outweighs those other issues we discussed earlier. Yeah. Pass through, nice. Mm -hmm. um, single layer of taxation, nice. Oh, thank you. Oh, look at that. Oh, thank you. Nice. See the benefits of a founding team. That's Seriously, why you don't want to be that. a solo founder. That's great. Right? That's you great. need someone else right, to help you with the beer. I'll have to open it for more defined terms. Yes. Okay. Um, but there are a lot of people who will say if you do the math, mm -hmm. that 1202 savings is profound. Yeah. And I mean, from a complexity standpoint, is it a lot harder to make a C Corp than an LLC? No. Why do people seem, I guess the reason Not anymore. Saying. Not okay. anymore, it's not. Hmm. And the reason is, is, is it more that, expensive? No, it's not. It feels like it was like a hundred, a couple hundred dollars for a Delaware C Corp so, versus like seventy dollars. So that's LLC. and that's a fair point. So founders mo are cheap. Most people, right? And, and that's a, it's a very good point. Most people will push you to be a Delaware corporation, whereas with LLCs, there's not as much of a bias yeah, we did towards the certain Ohio, state. That's fine, know. right? And people do that all the time, and and I think that generally holds true. So that's right. You can be an LLC in Ohio or Kentucky or Michigan or mm -hmm. you know Missouri or wherever for a hundred bucks for two hundred mm -hmm. bucks to be a Delaware C corporation. You got to pay Delaware probably five hundred dollars, yep. and you have to pay something to the state where you live. Okay. So you know instead of paying a hundred dollars, maybe it's seven hundred dollars. Yeah. But then it's thirty percent taxes. That's right. On five years of profits. That's right. It's a pretty, it seems like from an ROI standpoint, yes, it seems like it's worth it. That's exactly right. Interesting. Okay. So the, the 1202 piece is big. Hmm. Um, another, another piece that's it's really important to keep in mind is there is a cultural element at play here. Okay. You know, and you've seen this, which is the bias that institutional venture capital in particular has for C corporations. Why is that? Part of it is. They themselves and are passed away. And when you say you're saying a venture capitalist. A venture capitalist. Yeah, VCs a VC like firm. C Corps. That's right. They like okay. C Corps. Because they are past the entities. You okay. know, they themselves are. Okay. And because of that, they have certain challenges in investing in other pass through entities. Mm. So it's hard for a VC to invest in an LLC. Oh, okay. Because stuff keeps passing through mm. and without getting into the details of it. It creates right, they some, get taxed in a way. And it, well, it creates some weird tax get challenges. Because then their LPs, their are LPs sit at the them. very end of the they chain. They have to then all of a sudden do weird yeah. tax stuff. That's exactly right. Got it. And we want to protect them from admin. That's, that's like the point. That's exactly yes. right. Actually, that's kind of the point of VCs in general is to protect their investors yes. from administrative work. That's right. Yeah. So the C Corp gives them a mm, firewall. Got it. Okay. So that's part of it. Another piece of it is, is it's just all of the terms and documentation around venture capital have grown up around C corporations. Okay. So it's kind of like, you, you know, people sometimes will do things like, and I see this a lot at this stage of my life where people are now empty nesters, mm -hmm. okay? And they had these big houses in the suburbs, right? They maybe one or two stories and sprawled. Mm -hmm. And now they're moving, you know, into a downtown condo, yeah. four story townhouse. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can take your suburban furniture and sort of smash it into your urban townhouse but it doesn't really work that mm -hmm. well. It wasn't bought for the space. Right. It's not the lazy boy. It's takes not up half right. Of the That's exactly yes. right. It's right. just it doesn't work that well. Mm -hmm. And it's a weird analogy, but it's kind of the case here. It's like over 50 years, deal terms, deal structures, types of documents and agreements, sort of grew up and developed around venture capital that mm -hmm. assume a C corporation okay. on the other side. You can make them work for LLCs, mm -hmm. but it's like taking the lazy boy and trying to fit it in the downtown okay. loft. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't fit right. Yeah. You can force it, but it's always off. So the VC, 
to simplify it, could you just say, if you're gonna take venture capital, you have to be a C-Corp? Well, and that's, so you just hit upon the, the key question that I always ask founders when okay. we're having this conversation, is I say, is your intention to raise venture capital, you know, or to raise even just basic outside money to fund mm -hmm. this? And if the answer is yes, I say, how soon? Okay. You know, six months, one year. If they tell me, yes, we are absolutely raising venture capital mm -hmm. and we're doing it within a pretty near term perspective, yeah. I push the C Corp hard. Okay. Now, if they come back based upon their, you know, 80 hours of research on the dark web and say that they want to be an LLC, yeah. fine, I'll put you in an LLC. I mean, I'm not going to fall on my sword on this, sure. but my counsel would be a C Corp. Okay. Flip side is if you tell me, we're going to bootstrap this for a while. Mm -hmm. We're going to see how it goes. We may never raise money. Yeah. Or we may just keep it within between the two or three of us forever. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe we will, but it's way down the road. And LLC is a great choice. Okay. It is. And under those mm -hmm. circumstances, that might absolutely be the right way to go. Great. That feels pretty clear. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I think that works pretty well. Okay. So in general, the general idea is if you're raising money, go C Corp. Yep. If you're not or unsure, go LLC. Yep. And that feels pretty good. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And you can always, if you need to switch, yes. you can switch. Yeah. Take a breath. This is not the end of the world. Exactly. Okay. All 100%. right. Topic covered. Another big topic yep. that uh, I think a lot of people debate over um, is specifically now it's time to get some investment, right? So maybe we've built something and finally maybe we're talking to an investor and sometimes they'll say, you know, what document are you using to raise this mm -hmm. money? So suddenly again, I'm back on Google and I'm searching, you know, how to raise money. And it, right. it suddenly I'm faced with a couple of decisions. Um, and it sounds like one is this idea of like, can I just sell a part of my company, like sell equity? Mm -hmm. um, but then there's this other concept called the convertible note, mm -hmm. um, which is like debt, but somehow it transforms into equity. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a newer thing on the market um, called a safe. Yep. Talk about these three things. I mean, how do we navigate this thing as a, as a founder? What's the right it's, it's really hard. This is, yeah. I mean, and it, it just, it's, it's not hard and that you okay. can make decisions and there's mm -hmm. some, some natural bends in the road, but it's one of these places where I just, I feel sorry for founders yeah. because I know that it's just, it's the kind of thing like you don't want to misstep. Yes. Also, and I didn't it, sign up for this. Like, I didn't you know, sign I'm like, up for I signed this. up to make a product, totally. talk to customers, and now all of a sudden I'm having to get really deep into exactly. kind of complex legal That's uh, right. documents. That's right. And if it's sort of like, you know what I didn't really understand before? I didn't really understand how to sort of kind of attract and recruit and cultivate talent in my organization. Mm -hmm. But that seems kind of cool to learn. Yes. Like I want to learn that. Yes. You know, maybe I didn't sign up for it, but it's kind of fun. Yes. This is not fun. No. No, it's pretty terrible at all. actually. All right, so, start at the very beginning. So if you start at the very beginning. Like equity, I, so let's say that me and a founder are 50-50. Yep. We got this thing and now an investor comes along and says, I want some of that. So what, how does that work yeah. in the first one? We just sell part of that. Right. What is that? Yeah. Right. And so, you know, this could be an eight hour conversation. Mm -hmm. Nobody has a tolerance for that. No. So we're going to boil it I down. Do Plus we would yes. be so drunk. Yes. <laughs> so we can't do that because there'd be so much jargon. So it would be the way to boil it down is first of all, let's just talk about stock for a quick second. Okay. If you get stock, that's ownership okay. that represents your ownership in the company. Mm -hmm. If you get it for services, you're getting common stock. Okay. Okay. Common stock. That's Directors. A term. It's a term. A term. All right. Yep. It's cool. kind of the default stock. Founders get common stock. Employees get common stock. Directors, advisors, consultants, anybody else who is saying, I'm going to give you services. You're going to mm -hmm. give me ownership. It's going to be common stock. Common stock. Okay. That's sweat equity. Okay. Is common stock. Cool. Um, preferred stock, mm -hmm. which, you know, some people have heard of another term. Yep. Right. Preferred stock is kind of like Corinthian leather. It sounds delicious. Yeah. So you want it. Corinthian. Because yeah, yeah. wouldn't you, you preferred. prefer it. Yeah. You know, naturally. Sounds you prefer preferable. stock. Yes. Right. You get it for money. Okay. Okay. Money gets preferred stock. Money gets preferred stock. Okay. If someone wants to pop up and say, hey, wait a minute, there was this one company I know about that got money and they sold common. Sure. There are exceptions to every rule. Sure. But we're talking 99.999% of the time. Services, common stock, money, okay. preferred stock. What's the difference between preferred and common? Great question. So. Preferred stock usually has some benefits from a governance perspective. They're probably going to get a board seat. Okay. They're probably going to get certain voting rights. 
you know, investors like that. They want the chance to lean in and have some say on some issues. Vote on certain issues like whether you sell the company. That's right. Um, That's right. Issue more stock. Yeah. That sort of thing. And by yeah. the way, jumping ahead a little bit, you're going to find similar voting provisions in convertible promissory notes, and you're going to find similar voting provisions in safes pretty frequently. Okay. Not always, but you usually don't see decisions made with respect to these instruments on that ground. Okay. You know, someone's not like, well, because of this governance issue, I'm going to pick preferred rather than the other two, or okay. I'm going to pick safes rather than the other two. It I, tends to yeah. be, it tends to be relatively agnostic. Yeah. Investors are going to get the right to influence that they need to get. Okay. So if you're thinking of it like if a, a company is a democracy, a representative republic like the yeah. United States, um, essentially common stock might get you know, two seats, mm -hmm. um, but then also you might have like uh, essentially preferred stocks like Rhode Island. It's not a lot of people, not a lot of geography, but it also gets two Senate seats um, because it's an, an it's its own little entity. That's right. And so essentially gives more power to the investor or yeah. the person who gave you money. Yep. Okay. And, and these rights usually don't run in such a way that um, that investors have the ability to affirmatively force something to happen. Mm -hmm. They tend to be more. Sometimes people refer to them as blocking rights. Okay. So. They can't say, hey, Blake, you're the founder. You have to sell the company. Okay. But they would say things like, if you came to the investors and said, hey, I want to sell the company, mm -hmm. they could they say, say no. no. Interesting. Um, you come and say, hey, I want to raise a lot more money. They could say no. Mm -hmm. But what they can't say is, hey, Blake, go raise a bunch more money okay. and make you do it. Got it. It doesn't work that way. Okay. And they tend to be big ticket issues and the sort of issues that you would expect your money investor to care about. Okay. You know? And... But they're going to run, they're basically going to be the same okay. safes to notes to preferred stock. Okay. So usually you're not going to make your decision based on those grounds. Okay. But in general, if, again, it's me and a 50-50 co-founder, yep. you know, we go and get an investor and we were just going to do straight equity, what would happen is that we would both have common stock because we earned it in here and we're both broke. And then this person comes in and they're going to give us money. They're going to get some portion of the yep. company. So um, our percentage is going to go down. They're going to come in. Um, but they also get a little bit of special rights with their preferred stock, which is the ability to say no um, to us uh, doing certain things like sell the company exactly or issue right. our stock. You got okay. it. You got it. And so the trick is, and then the reason we had these other instruments pop up, is that if you are selling stock, you need to come up with the value of the company. A value. Okay. A value. Or you know, people talk about it as valuation. Mm -hmm. And the reason Why do you is, have to do that? Well, yeah. that's, that's a good question. Because what's happened is, is you know, you and your founder have decided you're going to raise money. Mm -hmm. Congratulations! Yep. Like you, you know, you've got something. You've done all the right stuff, and you start, you know, wandering the earth trying to find the right investor. And you put on 20 pounds of Panera weight, and mm -hmm. you're going through the whole process. <laughs> and you finally get an investor who says, "I like, I like the team. I like mm -hmm. the product. I like the market. I like everything about this." And I agree, you guys want $100,000 and I want to invest $100,000 in you. Mm -hmm. So I mean, how the, everything is, is lining great. up. But the question is, is well, what does $100,000 buy? Yeah, what percent of the Do they get do 1%? They get? Percent? Yeah. Do they get 10%? Right. Do they get 80%? That's mm -hmm. valuation, right? right? And I think it's actually important to clarify that. So it's like why the, the formula to get the valuation is like if they're saying I want $100,000 for 50% of the company, yep. um, it's like, okay, cool. What's the other half worth? The that's other right. half would be worth a hundred thousand. That's right. Since it's a hundred thousand, so that's like add that together. That's the value of the company. Yep. Right. So that'd be two hundred thousand dollars. Yep. Okay. And so you have to agree on that. Mm -hmm. Now, you know there and are. So how do you agree? How do you come up with a valuation? Great question. So what happens over time is that, and it's what it's part of what's really interesting about like working in this space, like I have for so long, mm -hmm. is that it these things ebb and flow mm -hmm. because this is we're talking about innovation, we're talking about disruption. Mm -hmm. And we're in a time now where there's a lot of understanding and um, sort of common assumptions made around valuation. Hmm. Companies at this stage should be valued at this. Companies at this stage should be valued at this. What do you, see that, what do you think those uh, rocks are? Like well, seed stage is? Seed stage is going to be somewhere between, you know, give or take, I mean, these are all give or take, mm -hmm. but somewhere between two and $5 million, mm -hmm. probably. So, yeah. you know, $100,000 would have to fit into that. Yes. You know, pretty small percentage. Yeah. Um, but there are, there are times where it's impossible to value a company because it's so new. Mm. You know, what is this? You right. know, because investors mm. can say, you, know, you can come to them and say, I think that my company's worth $5 million, 
because I can point to these six other companies over there that were worth five million at this stage. Yeah. Investors can say, I think you're worth three million because of those six companies over here that were worth three million yeah. at that stage. We're in one of those moments now. Yeah. But there are times where we're not in that moment. And a, the big time when this happened was the dot com era, mm -hmm. which is going way back, prehistoric sure. times. Yep. You know. And but in that era, and that was when I got started doing this stuff, it was all new. No one had ever sold, you know, dog food yeah. you know, globally before. Right. In a way where they could get directly to the customer. What's that company worth? Is it worth right. nothing? Because you're never gonna make money doing it? Right. You know, because the profit gets squeezed out? Mm -hmm. Or is it worth a gazillion dollars? Yeah. Because the market share could be so massive and the revenue could be so high. Hmm. So you you did your whole Panera thing. Yes. You know, pumps to you know, props to Panera. Yes. You know, giving them a plug. Yeah. And you agree that it's a hundred thousand dollars, I know. Yeah. You agree that it's a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars and the investor feels like, well, I mean, I believe in this, but I think I should own 50% of the company. Right. I think the company's worth $100,000, my $100,000 on top, so yep. 100,000, 50, 50. Yeah. You're like, no, this is massive. Right. We're worth $100 million right now. Yes. And you're so far apart from each other. Like, right, how do you you, actually, and you yeah. can't bridge that. Yeah. You can't bridge it. Hmm. You know, you want to sell me a Corolla, mm -hmm. and you want to sell it to me for 900 bucks, yeah. and I want to pay you $800, yeah. we can figure that out. Yes. But you want to sell it to me for $100,000 and I want to pay 100 bucks? We're not bridging that gap. Yeah. And that happened in the dot-com era. Mm. So people were like, how do we fix this? Mm. We still want to do a deal, yeah. but we can't agree on valuation because mm. we can't agree on that ownership percentage issue. Yes. And that's where convertible notes came from. Okay. So What's a convertible note? Yeah. yeah. Good question. We should probably drink mm -hmm. since that's jargon. Yeah. Yeah. So these go by lots of names. They go by convertible notes, convertible promissory notes. Mm. Um, convertible some, debt. Convertible debt. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, fancy New York lawyers who charge way too much call them debentures or oh, bonds. Right. It's debenture. Yeah, it's spiffy. Yeah, that's, right? yeah. You're like, that's when you're at, the, at the, that echelon of you can barely breathe because the hourly rate is so high. Yes. <laughs> um, but they're all the same thing. Okay. It, is, it just represents debt. It's an IOU. Mm. You know? Okay. So instead of selling a part of the company to this person, yep. you're saying, actually, we're just going to take a loan. For we're it. just going to take a loan. Okay. And we're going to change the, we're going to change the way this deal works. Mm -hmm. You're not investing in me and getting X percentage of the company. Mm -hmm. You're loaning me money. Got it. Okay. So now you listen, you think about that and you're like, well, that, that's not really what the parties want. Right. Because the company doesn't want to have to pay it back. Mm -hmm. And the investor is not looking to just get a little bit of interest. Right. They actually want an ownership percentage. Right. The whole idea is we can park it mm -hmm. as debt for a period of as time a placeholder. as a placeholder yes. until we have another financing down the road where you raise more money mm -hmm. from someone who can come up and put a real valuation. And there are more the comparables maybe more down the and road. And there are more comparables then. Okay. Exactly. And so the reason they prefer to be in debt versus uh, doing that, one, is obviously the valuation. But two is if things go awry, it's a little safer to be in debt, well, right? And that can help too, because you can, you know, if you, if, if you know what the right side of a balance sheet looks like, you've got liability on top and mm -hmm. equity on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And that's how the waterfall flows. Yep. And you're right, if things go badly, liability you gets pay paid first. first that's before right. you pay off any of that's right. Okay. So there are some soft advantages that safer. associate with yeah. that. Yeah. Other people would say companies like this, when they go out of business, there's it's, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a wreckage anyway, sure. but you know, that's a soft benefit to it. Sure. But the big benefit that was is a real, that was a reality when we sold Cladwell, that was a reality that people that got there. Reality. They, they actually, the debt holders made some money. Yeah. Because at that point in time, it was, you were further down the road and yes. there was real value there. Yes. And so even if, even if the company didn't become an $18 billion company, mm -hmm. it was going to become something. Yes. And, and you know, that, that yeah. could matter. So yeah. absolutely. You're absolutely right. Okay. So the note is. It, it's it's provisional. Mm -hmm. It's temporary. Yep. It's a way for us to have like a little You're kicking capsule. the can down You're the kicking road. the can down the road. That makes sense to me, especially like uh, in the instance of having a really vetted founder. Mm -hmm. Like let's say you know you have Mark Zuckerberg is starting another company, right? I, I can imagine the moment the moment he starts another company, if he ever did, it's like if he has an idea, a PowerPoint deck, and him. What is that worth? Yep. I mean, it seems like it'd be worth a huge amount of money. Huge. Um, but it's really hard to define that if yep. it was just a deck, right. right? So that would make sense. That'd be an instance where it makes sense. Like, let's kick this down the road mm -hmm. and like just put some money into this. Yep. Yeah. And then we wait. And then we, you know, you as the founders go out and you 
you know, you work on the product and you build the product and you see if you can sell it to some folks and you see if you can get some traction and you see what that looks like and you've got a better sense as to what, you know, what your market looks like, what your mm -hmm. addressable market looks like, yep. um, how much customers will pay for it, who the customers are, what yep. it takes to get them to buy. And you start to get more data mm -hmm. and you can get a better understanding around valuation. Yep. And, and that's what you're trying to do with a note. And normally what happens is you have some sort of, you get a deal on mm -hmm. that next round. So when it does turn into equity, it's not at the same terms as that next round, That's right. but it's a, a slight discount, yep. right? And exactly. It's, you know, 20 or 30%. That's right. Yep. And, and so what happened was with this, these first generation of notes, there was a sense that we're willing to wait for the valuation moment. Mm -hmm. We'll you know, kick, it, kick it down the road for nine months, two years, mm -hmm. sometimes four years, yeah. but we need some kind of juice for that. Yes. Like you got to give us some kind of Absolutely. consideration. Because you are but way earlier. You're in. way earlier. Yeah. And that's what the discount is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And usually it's 20%. Yep. You're right. It could be five. It could be 50. It's usually 20%. Yep. And the simple math is if at the point in time where the new money comes in mm -hmm. and says, we think the company is worth this much and everybody runs their Excel spreadsheet mm -hmm. and they say that translates to a dollar a share. Yeah. If there's a 20% discount, 80 cents a share. It's 80 cents a share. Yeah. Which means I get more stock. That makes sense. Right? Yeah. And that's how that works. Yeah. The problem with that is that it is real debt, like mortgage debt, debt, which means that there's an interest rate. That's right. Right? And this, uh, suddenly that math, I, I've made that Excel spreadsheet before, it starts getting really complex. Yep. And well, and there's another thing that associates with that is not only is there an interest rate, which is a house, and by the way, there has to be an interest rate mm. because the internal revenue service, among other authorities say, we don't believe that people lend money for free. Okay. So yep. you have to have an interest rate in order for this to be done. Except for the government, but that's right. another topic. <laughs> yes. Ooh, I like Zinger. that. So yeah. um, they, they say there has to be an interest rate. Mm -hmm. And you're right, it's a pain. And it just, it makes the spreadsheet a little bit more complicated. But yep. there's a more existential issue, and that's the maturity date. And you've seen this as a founder. Right. Yes. How yeah. scary that is. Yes. Because the maturity whole maturity date, which is a new new, new, new term. term. Okay. That's right. Yep. Let's, okay. let's drink to that. So, if you really boil it down to be debt, it's got to have two things. It's got to have interest. Interest. Yep. Okay. It's a hassle, but we can manage it. Okay. But it also needs a maturity date. Mm -hmm. There needs to come a point in time where it comes due. Where well, you have to pay the debt. You back. have to pay back. And this debt is, I think this is an important distinction. This debt is, it's not like a car loan. It's not like a mortgage. Mm -hmm. You're not paying on an installment basis. Yes. You don't pay principal and interest every yes. month. You just pay it at the very end. At the very end. Yeah. And the whole hope is, is that you never pay it. Yes. You know, the bet is that I take the money here and I set the maturity date far enough down the road that I'm going to have this conversion moment before then. Yes. You know, when the new money comes in, they pay a buck. Yep. This note converts at 80 cents and everybody's happy. Yes. Right. But I can tell you more often than not, and I mean it more often than not, mm -hmm. you hit the maturity date before you, you lose the money. What's the typical length of time? 18 to 24 months. 18 to 24 months. And so market. most times they hit it. They hit it. They can't get it raised because it always takes twice as long and costs yep. twice as much. Of course it does. Yeah. And we hit ours. I remember that. We and and, and it's painful. And that's what happens. Yep. So now as the founder, you have to go to the investors and ask for an extension. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of 10, investors totally get it. Yeah, ours were totally They say, it. look, this yeah. maturity date, it was arbitrary. It wasn't tied to anything mm -hmm. that really meant anything. It is scary though. It, but it's scary because they can say no. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they do say no. Mm -hmm. And now you're stuck. Now you got to repay it? Yeah. Well, it's game over. And then you say, but it's game over. I can't repay it. And then they say, well, let's make it a little sweeter. Yeah. You know, you know how we right. said a 20% discount? How about a 50% discount? Right. You know, or it's 8% interest. Maybe it should be 20% interest. They've yeah, got that leverage. What can you say? Like you, you can't, do can't. Yeah. you have to, you have to yes. concede and it. And that's the downside of the convertible note, totally. which is like it, these, these little things are kind of, uh, yeah. they're poison pills yeah. that eventually you know, come. Yeah. What I would say, and I don't like to transact in like, fear and terror. Mm -hmm. So the advice that I give, because I do convertible notes all the time, mm -hmm. and not only from the investor side, but also from the company side. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they're absolutely the right choice. Mm -hmm. And what I would say to founders is that this is a legitimate, it's a legitimate concern. Mm -hmm. You need to be aware of it and understand it. The best way to counteract it is to build good relationships with your investors. Because most of the time, mm -hmm. when you see an investor, you know, being a jerk, mm -hmm. the reason they're being a jerk is because the founder hasn't 
reached out to them in two years. Yeah. Founder doesn't return their emails. Founder doesn't give them updates. Yep. Founder doesn't talk to them. Founder disregards them. Mm -hmm. Founder behaves narcissistically. Sure. And and this is their moment where the mm -hmm. investor gets to say, huh, they interesting. Punish them. Yeah, right. they get to punish them. Yeah. And like, you thought you could take advantage of me? Hmm. Not so much, buddy. Hmm. And so if you want the best way to sort of prepare for that, yeah. it's just basic, just good relationship principles. Yes. And you'll save yourself from a lot of that mm. angst. But What's it's still though, a legitimate that concern. It also goes the opposite, opposite way, which is that Fair. as an investor, if you want to keep whatever percentage you have in the company, only two things matter, right? The strength of the relationship, and then also whether you're participating in the next round of funding. That's right. Right? And so it's like, if those two things are true, you're going to have a, things are going to go great. But yeah. if one of those things is not true, you're going to get diluted. Every no, time. that's right. Yeah. I mean, I always say to people, including investors, is that at any point in time, you can take your jargon cap table. Mm, yeah. Um, I'm amazed that we've gotten this long without saying cap table. That's impressive. It's pretty incredible. Cap table, which is short for capitalization table. Mm -hmm. Which is just who owns what. Who owns what. Mm -hmm. And at any moment, you can look at a cap table and you can break it into three parts. Mm -hmm. One part is the people that make the business run. Mm -hmm. And everybody cares about them. Mm -hmm. Even though you may not feel like people care about you, mm -hmm. they do because you're the ones that have to make this work. Mm -hmm. So there's that cohort. Yep. Then there's the cohort, which is the new money coming in. Yep. They care a lot about themselves. Yes. Right? Yep. They want a whole big chunk of the company. Mm -hmm. They want to make sure they're positioned to get a good you know, return on their investment. But they also want to make sure that you know, the people that are making the gear spin, yes. that they're taken care of. Yep. Which takes you to the third cohort, which is the old money. Yes. Right? Nobody cares about that. Nobody cares about the old yes. money. Yes. Except the old money people. Right. But a lot of times they don't have the ability to sort of lean in and push. Yeah. So this is the point you're making. The best way for the old money to protect itself and not get squeezed yep. is to maintain a good relationship with the founders. Yes. And to, to be in the category of new money. And to be in the category of new money. Yeah. But if you, are, if you are old money, and if the founder feels like, you know what, when times were tough, that person stood by me. Yeah. They always took my calls. They always offered advice. When I needed to get a beer, they bought me a beer. When yep. I needed to cry, they gave me a hug. Yeah. You know, that stuff matters. It really does. And there could become a point in time where, you know, you could be this or you could be this. Yep. And the only thing keeping you here is because the founder is, is, fighting, defending, for is fighting for Absolutely. you with the new money. Yes. And so the relationships do run both ways. Yes. Totally agree with that. Hmm. That is a good segment. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting topic. But it's an, important, yeah. it's an important point, a soft point. Yes. But like not only goes to like just being a good human. Yes. And like building interesting businesses, but it's dollars and cents. Yes. You know, all yeah. these issues, it really does translate into that. Yeah. It's an interesting one. This is definitely an aside, but the relationship between the investor and the founder is a really interesting one. Yeah. In that, I think there were times where an investor would act like an investor, and I would feel a relational violation, mm. where I, I'm saying like, w I thought we were friends, you know? Yeah. And I remember early on, especially that really bothered me, and then eventually I finally realized like, oh, the nature of our relationship is transactional. Yeah. Um. So then I was like, great we would not be friends except for the fact that we're transacting. So then I put it in that bucket and that almost gave me the ability to have still a great relationship, but in the bucket of a transactional relationship. Yep. That makes sense. And I think that that's totally. the way to think about it. I think a lot of times yep. I've seen founders think of it as transactional and therefore they're not relational mm -hmm. or they think of it as relational and then they're surprised when it gets transactional. Yep. But the best way to think about it, I think is to say this is transactional. Right and every relational movement you make is going to be very beneficial for both sides. Exactly. Yeah. That's really well put. I totally yeah. agree. It's both. Yeah. It's both. And you need to be sensitive to both. Yeah. You can't lose sight of either. It's tricky. Yeah. It's you tricky. really have to do it. It's tricky. Yeah. But it, it gets to this point, I love the way you said it earlier, where it's like, I just got into this because I had this idea and I wanted to build. Yes. You know, I wanted to build this specific like product or solution. Yes. And now all of a sudden you're talking about safes and notes and preferred stock and you're thinking about these relationships with these investors and how to manage that and all it's it's complicated being a founder it is there it really is just but it's i mean if you're a curious person it yeah. actually does kind of starts to get it gets a little bit fun mm -hmm. just to be like oh it's a new topic that i get to understand so totally on that okay so we've talked about just straight equity yep which is like okay we've established a valuation you give me a hundred thousand dollars and we say the company's worth 200 so you get 50 percent mm -hmm. that's pretty straightforward that's pretty uh easy then we said, okay, well, if we can't establish that valuation, we're going to do the convertible note. Um, what's cool about that is that it kicks the can down the road, talking about the valuation, um, and it also kind of protects the person because now they're in debt as opposed to being in equity. 
um, but with it came some baggage, specifically the interest rate, and then also this uh, the, the maturity date. Yeah, the maturity date, the mm -hmm. come to Jesus moment, which is when we have to pay it back. That's right. Um, now talking about the evolution of the final version that we've seen so far, um, which is uh, the safe. The safe, yeah. exactly. So, um, perfect summary, great segue. Thanks. Yes, um, I think you've done this once or twice. Yeah. So, first things first, SAFE is an acronym. Okay. It stands for Simple Agreement for Equity. Really? Yes. I thought the F was for future. Well, it could be for future equity. Okay. You can read it that way too. Okay. So you can, you can play around with the acronym a little bit, okay. but it's either Simple Agreement for Equity or Simple okay. Agreement for Future Equity. Okay, but that'd be two Fs in the same. That'd be two Fs. It's, 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 yes. yes. right. yeah. it's French. Yeah. So <laughs> what do you do with it? French New Wave directors, you know, yes. yeah. in cinema. So it would be, it was invented by Y Combinator. Okay. And Y Combinator being an accelerator in Silicon Valley. Yep. And yeah. because it's an accelerator and because it's in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. it, you know, it sort of it punches above its weight class, exerts mm -hmm. a lot of influence. Yes. You know, what they say and do um, has an impact. Yeah. And not to put words in their mouth, but I will. The bottom line was they said, you know, Preferred stock is fine, mm -hmm. but it does require some level of work to sort of negotiate between the parties what the terms are. And we didn't even get into all the details there, but yeah. let's just say for the sake of setting the table, mm -hmm. that preferred stock is in many respects a whiteboard. Okay. And there are a lot of issues that need to be sorted through. Mm -hmm. Anytime you need to sort through issues, that means you're dealing with lawyers. Mm -hmm. And anytime you're dealing with lawyers sorting through issues, it costs more money. Yes. Now, if this is a $20 million financing, who cares? Right. But if it's a $50,000 financing, that matters a lot. That becomes a real issue. The transaction cost yes. is the way we would, yeah. that's the term we would ascribe to it. Convertible notes, you know, by comparison are pretty easy. Yeah. You know, it's how much you're investing. They're easy now. They're easy now. You're kicking some of those issues down the road. Yes. But you're not, you don't have to pay lawyers as much. Yes. And you can get them done quickly. Mm -hmm. They're basically form it's documents. It's a two-page document um, with dollar That's amount right. and signature. Unless yeah. you have a New York lawyer that calls it a bond and then sure, it's 20 sure. pages and it's yeah. really expensive. But, it's, um, but everybody else who's normal, it's, it's really simple and easy to do. Obviously, that's a trigger for me. Mm -hmm. um, but the issue is the point that you raised. The interest rate is, there's yep. a hassle factor. Yes. There's some weird tax issues associated with it. And the maturity date, Yes. is terrifying. And the last part is that the conversion instance does have some complexity in there too. Like, the, like uh, there's some ambiguity in the convertible note that when it actually converts, there is a secondary negotiation that sometimes happens, yep. um, which is like, wait, what does that term really mean? And you, there's a back and forth. Yeah, I think that's right. And that's a fair point to raise, which these things are, these convertible instruments, it's not always as smooth as you want it to be or as automatic no. as you want it to be. Yeah. Um, you would think that it should be, Yes. But it's just in the There's wild. There's a little bit of fuzziness. Yeah. yeah. You know, the kudzu kind of gets in the yes. middle of yeah. it. Um, so safes. Mm -hmm. So Y Combinator 2013-ish said, you know, preferred stock works. By the way, at this point, we're beyond this whole era of, is this company worth $100 million or worth, is it worth 100 bucks? Yes. Is your Corolla worth $100,000? Right. We know. Like, we're within a tighter band. Yes. So the valuation is not as much of an issue anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, so we could just go back to stock, yeah. right? We don't need to kick the can down the road. Yeah. But we still, we like notes because they're simple. Yes, because like when you sell equity of doing the like, okay, come on, I'm, you know, buy a chunk. That's like a 25 to 50 page document. Yes, um, that's right. And a note could be two pages. It. Right, that convertible note was nice because it was only two pages. That's yeah. right. So notes kind of, they, and, and the reason I say that is they developed a different rationalization. Mm -hmm. The original rationalization was we're going to do a note because we can't agree on valuation. Uh -huh. Now we're doing notes because they're cheap. Yeah. Right? So it's a different reason. It's a different reason. Hmm. And that just changed over 20 years of doing yeah. this stuff. So we could do stock, but it's expensive. We could do notes, it's cheap, but you've got the interest rate and the maturity date. Mm -hmm. So Y Combinator said, let's try to like see if we can toy around with this a little bit. Yeah. And they said, could we have a note? that didn't have the interest rate okay. and didn't have the maturity date. Mm -hmm. In other words, you give me $100,000 yep. and we just wait, we kick the can down the road, yep. we wait until that next financing whenever comes that up, happens, whenever that comes up, then it converts. And then it converts. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what a safe is. Mm -hmm. A simple agreement for equity or a simple agreement for future equity. That's what it is. Okay. Um, but it's not debt because it doesn't have an interest rate or a maturity date. Right. So it has to be equity. So the question is, is what kind of equity? Mm -hmm. And it's an option. It's a warrant. Or yeah. a warrant. You have yeah. to drink twice, mm -hmm. I think. So without falling too far down that well, it's a right to acquire stock in yes. the future. And that's all it is. And okay. in fact, if you want to elaborate have, on So if the company goes under or gets sold, does it have preference? Does it get paid out first? Generally, it says that it gets its money back first. Interesting. So it's, a, uh, it's an option with the preference. With that yeah. sort of built into Interesting. it. Okay. Yeah. But it's a clever. It's a really clever instrument. Yeah. And I mean, and they deserve a ton of credit for thinking outside the box and developing something which was new. Yeah. You know, it was innovative. It was disruptive. Yeah. It, it took a long time to get traction. Okay. Because people were so, they were like preferred stock or convertible notes. Yeah. Liability or equity. I mean, yeah. it was sort of like, you know, A or B, B yeah. or C. It was very binary. And then the same came in. Of the Cola. Yeah. Yeah. Cola. Of the Cold Wars. Yes. That's right. And um, it took some time, but now you see there's a ton of traction behind yeah. safes because they are so simple. It's easy. It's easy. Yeah. It's and it really easy. clearly defines it. I think the advantage from a founder's perspective is that the lack of ambiguity. Yeah. Is it actually just says you get 5%, right? And so I remember we'd used a KISS, which, sorry, that's another term, but- 500 um, startups. Yeah, right? 500 startups, right. like Y Combinator, another accelerator in Silicon Valley, um, they uh, they created the KISS, which same essentially the same exact document, right? That's right. Like, yeah. It's, it um, is. But I remember when we did 500 startups KISS, we had all this math and all this Excel work that we had to do for everyone else's convertible notes. Yeah. And then the KISS was just a, a blue cell of just like input the number. Yeah. Um, it's very simple. Very yeah. simple. Yeah. And it, there's no maturity date. Hmm. There's never that point with a kiss or with a safe yep. where it comes due. Yeah. So you never have to have that moment of terror where yeah, you're like, point of leverage. Which is, it's, it is, it's, a, yeah. it's a point of leverage, it's an arbitrary point of leverage. Yes. That is just a function yeah. of the formality of yeah. the note. So what, to go back to the very original question you asked and how we started down this road was, what should a founder ask for? Yeah. Should they ask for a preferred stock? Should they ask for a convertible note? Mm -hmm. Or should they ask for a safe? And I think I would say that nine times out of 10, a safe is best, hmm. a convertible note is second, okay. and preferred stock is third. Hmm. That being said, if an investor insists on investing in preferred stock, and you like the terms, and yeah. you like the investor- Don't turn down money. Take it. Yeah, absolutely. Take it. Yes. Absolutely take it. This is not a place where you, draw some hard theological line yes. and you say, I am committed to this one type of instrument yeah. and I'm inflexible. Hmm. It is, you should remain flexible and you hmm. should remain open-minded. Hmm. But yeah, I mean, I think if you just have to hard rank, you hard rank it that way. Okay. Safe, safe, no, no. preferred stock, okay. for sure. Great. Um, and there's, there's a lot of flexibility that associates with that. I'm gonna say one caveat, okay. which is, so I'm an attorney, the Y Combinator documents work. Okay. Mm -hmm. The Y Combinator documents are the safe documents. Mm -hmm. They're download downloadable off the Y Combinator for website free. for free. Yes. And they kind of give you a way of working through a menu of what you want and what the terms are. They work. They're good. You don't need a lawyer to review those. Yeah. You fill in the fields, you sign it, the investor signs it, they send you it's the great. money. It's great. It's easy. Mm -hmm. And even as an attorney that gets paid to do this all the time, I say, go do it. Mm -hmm. It's fine. You know, by the way, if I think I'm going to make money in this business off the back of people doing $50,000 saves, that's not a great revenue model. Money, yes. No. So I'm in it for the long haul. Yes. But here's the problem is that if you, because safes are do it yourself mm -hmm. for the most part, it becomes very easy for founders to start to tinker with terms. Mm. And you have to be really careful as a founder. What terms do you typically see people tinker with? So people will, will, people will tinker around with the discount. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it'll be 10%, sometimes it'll be 30%, okay. sometimes it'll be 20, sometimes mm -hmm. 50. Um, and then we didn't talk about this, but there's this, some, this notion of the cap. Yes, which is uh, yeah, the cap. Right, which is a valuation expression. It's a maximum valuation. It's a maximum valuation, yes. okay. saying under no circumstances will this instrument, be whether it's a this. note or a safe, yes. 
converted a level yeah. higher than this. So essentially people will, they'll tweak it and tweak it and tweak it, tweak it depending tweak it. on which investor they're right. talking to. And the challenge comes- and That creates administrative work. There's, and it becomes problematic when you reach a point where you actually have hit that moment where somebody is writing the big check, mm -hmm. they are buying preferred stock, mm -hmm. they are valuing the company, um, and now we're gonna convert all of these notes mm -hmm. and or all of these safes yes. into preferred stock. If everybody has the same term, it's easy. It's I mean, the Excel spreadsheet just spits it out. Yep. But if we have all of these different terms, it becomes really complicated. Yes. And the math never works. Yes. Because the order of conversion matters and you end up having to brute force a closing, which leaves a lot of people upset. Yes, and it does end up becoming probably a negotiation. Yes, in that instance. yes. Yeah. So, you know, what I would say is, is look, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah. If you need to make payroll and it's, you gotta get the money to the payroll provider at three o'clock on Wednesday, yeah. and it's noon on Wednesday, and this person is insisting on a different discount rate, you yep. give them a different discount rate. Yeah, you, gotta, you gotta get to Thursday. Yep. But if you have the ability to sort of manage this, my strong encouragement and urging to founders is try to maintain harmony. Yes, and these or at least have tranches, like right, like you know, buckets of like, okay, these right. people are in this bucket, these people are in this bucket. Fair that enough, but don't don't load up too many of these because it gets really messy. That makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Okay. okay. So to be clear, safe's number one in terms of simplicity for startups. Yep. Followed by convertible note, followed by a priced round until a little bit later. That's right. Okay. That's right. But cool. if a price round shows up and they insist on being a price round, take it. Take it. Absolutely. Money's money, man. Okay. All right. Well Cheers. Done. Yes. Like it. Yeah. All right, another topic yes. um, that I wanted to have you talk about is, uh, as a founder, I think we just feel like there are all these landmines, especially on the legal side, um, that we're trying to avoid, but we don't know what they are. What are the major mistakes that you're, I mean, how many founders are you working with on like an annual basis? Wow, over 100. 100 founders, so like, right. what are the, I feel like there's gotta be some pattern of what you see in terms of the big mistakes that people make. Yep. Um, can you just save us some time, save us some money? What are those things that we can avoid? Yeah, totally. So first things first, you know, and you and I have talked a lot about this, Blake, is that the, the attorney founder relationship, mm -hmm. it's not just sort of a vendor relationship. No. You know, ideally it becomes a friendship. Yeah. You know, it really needs to be collaborative. And I would encourage, founders oftentimes wait too long. To hire a lawyer? To, or, and I would, I would actually rephrase it, to engage with a lawyer. Okay, what's the difference? So the difference would be, I, I don't turn on the clock, so to speak. I'm not hired for a long time. Hmm. And because I do think the relationship is important and I want the person to feel comfortable calling me. Mm -hmm. And if they feel like they, that I'm charging them every time they do, yeah. you know, before they're in a position to pay, they're not gonna call, which means they're gonna, they could get into trouble. Yeah. So even if, you know, they're using tools like boilerplate, mm -hmm. even if they're using Y Combinator safes, mm -hmm. you know, even if they're using other sort of resources where they can do some of the stuff on their own, which is great. Yeah. There's no reason that you can't have, you know, a lawyer in the bullpen mm -hmm. that you can sort of reach out to and just say, hey, you know, can I ask you a question? Can I buy you a beer? Yeah. Can I buy you breakfast? And yeah. just, you know, kick a couple things around. If you- By the way. Sierra Cantabria. Yes. Precisely. Yes. That's yeah. right. Um, lawyers who do this work do this all the time, hmm. which is sort of sign number one. If your lawyer won't do this, that's not that's a lawyer a you should be working yeah. with, hmm. right? So it just kind of comes with the territory. Number one, it's frankly, this is the transactional piece. It's what we have to do to win clients, hmm. to develop those relationships. But the more important piece, the existential piece is, you get into this because you like founders. Hmm. There's no other reason to do this work unless you like founders. Yeah. And so you get where founders are coming from. So you actually and you want, want to talk to these founders. You want to talk to them. But and what you're finding is that you're finding that founders are they wait not talking to you because, because they're they afraid. hear that you're $400 an hour or something like They've that. They've never worked yeah. with a lawyer before. Yeah. Or the only time that they know about a lawyer is they're like, well, I had a cousin who had a DUI mm. or you know someone else who got sued or I yeah. had that great uncle who was in that nasty probate litigation. I mean. You know, they think about it in this context where it's scary and it's expensive yeah. and it's intimidating. Anybody, wherever you live, you can ask around and you will find, I promise you, someone that will get referred to you who is like this, 
who will have this conversation. Is the startup with you. lawyer. Yeah. 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 And they may not even live in the town. It's a good, like, who's the startup exactly. lawyer I should talk to? That's right. Hmm. And it's not, it's not six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Yeah. You know, it's like two degrees of Mark Zuckerberg or something. Yeah. But I mean, it's like really tight. Like you get to these people fast. Yeah. And, and those people are actually open to conversation. And they're open to conversation. Because your incentive is actually not to make a buck no. on me, you know, you know, paying to, you know, have a beer with you. It's that you're looking for an acquisition or, you know, future litigation or like a big event. That's exactly future. right. Yeah. Right. This is I don't buy billboard space. Yeah. You know, my marketing <laughs> is spent hanging out. Yeah. Right? And so that's just how it works for people like me. Yeah. So that's the first mistake is well, people what, who wait too the, long. What's the downside? What happens? They end up just making bad decisions. They make bad decisions. Okay. Use um, a rocket lawyer or easily, something like that, or like. Or they do they do things like so now let's just talk about some of the mistakes they might make. Okay, but in general, first point was first point is they don't engage a lawyer. Engage a and lawyer. Therefore, they make the second point mistake. That's right. Okay. And it's it's not to say hire a lawyer. Mm -hmm. It's to start to develop a relationship with yes. a lawyer. They don't talk with a lawyer. Right. And by the way, just straight up ask. Say, are you okay with me buying you a beer and reaching out from time to time and just, you know, for yeah. free? And, and the, the lawyer should be totally down for that. Yes, and you if know, they're not, it's the wrong lawyer. It's the wrong lawyer. Okay. That's right. But if they start saying things like, well, I'll give you one hour for free and then after, yeah. just hang up. Okay. Right? I mm -hmm. mean, find the next one. So now what sort of mistakes do people make? Okay. The first one, a big one, is around intellectual property. Okay. Okay. And so IP mm -hmm. is what people refer to it as. If we are going to talk generally, if I am a W-2 employee mm -hmm. working for a company, the general rule is the company owns my IP. Your ideas. My ideas. Uh -huh. You know, they're paying me. Yep. I'm working for them. Yep. You know, part of what they get and part of what I give in exchange for my paycheck mm -hmm. is the ideas. Yes. You know, these inventions, these conceptions, yes. you know, they own it. That's the general default rule. Mm -hmm. But here's what catches a lot of startup companies contractors it works the other way hmm. the contractors actually own what they create all they're selling you is the right to use it hmm. and most startup companies particularly startup companies in tech that are looking for some sort of product to be built yeah they are probably engaging an outside resource for that yeah there a lot of times they're going to use contractors instead of That's using exactly employees. right okay and because it, it's not fixed payroll, and when you don't know where your money's come from, that makes sense. Okay. That's right. So they're going to work with a you know a dev shop, mm -hmm. which is you know short for development shop. Yeah. And they're going to go find that, and they're probably going to have a terrible experience with the first one, yes. and that's that's a different set of videos for you to yep. make. Um, but they're eventually going to get to one that's going to create something. Hmm. But who owns the, that? Yeah. Who owns it? And the startup is just going to think, oh, I I paid for it. Right. I own it. Yeah. Well, if you don't have the contract right. They own it. Hmm. You bought the right to use it, but they can go sell that to other people. Interesting. Even if you use like maybe a, I, I could also see like you have a cousin who uh, is an engineer and so they build something for you and you pay them a thousand bucks to do it. But technically, if you haven't defined it, then they, they probably own it. own it. Okay. And you have a license or a right okay. to use it. And so it. then what, fast forward down the road, what's the impact of that? Um, that is catastrophic. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, there aren't. And I use that term with great hesitation mm -hmm. because it's, you know, you don't want to just create terror and, you know, shooting minefields all over yeah. the place. But if you don't own your intellectual property, you're not fundable. What do you have? What do you have? Right. If and that Google algorithm, it's the first question. If, you pay, that, if the Google algorithm belongs to some contractor right. over here, what is Google? Yeah. yeah. Coke mm -hmm. without the formula for Coke. Yeah. If they just have the right to license it and if that person could go give it to other people. Yeah. What do you have? Okay. So you've got to, and it's a big mistake. Up. You've got okay. to lock it up. And it's not hard. Hmm. It's not hard. You have a company, you create your entity, yep. an LLC or a C Corp or whatever you are, and you just need to make sure that that paper, and it can be one page, yeah. says, I'm giving you $1,000. Mm -hmm. You're going to do this for me, and I own it. Got it. It's as simple as that. Hmm. You know, with more words because we're lawyers and we like to talk a little bit sure. and get a little redundant. Sure. But that's the basic idea. Okay. So that's a big mistake. That's a big one. Okay. And now, again, 99 times out of 100, even if it, the mistake is made, it's fixable. Hmm. You can go back. It's one of the things we do a lot of times if we're brought in later. Yeah. Someone finally engages us and we see this contract or lack thereof. Yeah. So you need you to put clean something that in place. Up. You yeah. clean it up. I remember the moment uh, with Cladwell. Uh, hmm. We were two or three years in. And I had to assign my IP, uh, assign my intellectual property. That's right. And I remember feeling a, a, just a moment of hesitation, like, wait, I, 
I've developed a lot of things and I do own it right yeah. now. And after I sign this, I won't. Um, now, obviously, I had a lot of incentives to give it to the company, but it was kind of a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you raise a really good point because it goes not only to outside contractors, but it can relate to the original yeah. founders too, because you probably weren't W 2s at the beginning. No. People don't set up W 2 relationships for a long time. Right. And what if you weren't with Cladwell anymore? Right. What if you had left? And it's, they come especially on bad terms. On bad terms. And then I can punish, you know, suddenly I have this opportunity. And that happens. I actually remember the moment of having to go back and have other people sign it. Yeah. And waiting with bated breath, totally. watching my email to see if it would come back in and sign. That's right. But yeah. Okay, so that's a good one. So uh, IP so first one is yep. not hiring a lawyer or not engaging a lawyer early enough. Um, yeah. or not buying beer for lawyers early enough. That's right. Uh, two is talking about IP. Okay, yep. so what's the third? The third would be equity. Equity. Yes. Okay. And that's ownership. Yes. Right? Who owns what? And waiting too long for that. Okay. Because the, the basic idea, boiled down to its very fundamentals, is that when you chop up a company mm -hmm. and say you get 20%, you get 30%, you get 40%, okay, that transaction, generally speaking, is taxable. Yes. You know, I'm giving you something mm -hmm. in exchange, you know, it's usually for services. Yeah. Okay. And the IRS is going to say, whether you get cash or stock or a cow, or Bitcoin or whatever, yeah. we're gonna tax you on it. Yeah. Now, if the company's not worth anything, so what? Right, not right? a deal. I get 40% of the company, that's a taxable transaction, ouch, mm -hmm. but it's only worth 10 bucks. Yeah. So I pay tax on 10 bucks. Yes. I write the IRS a $3 check. Right. I can do that. Yeah. But if you wait, and this is the irony, and you create value, mm -hmm. which is a great thing, yes. right? Like you've developed this, it's, you've got a lot of, and you're going around and people are, we talked to, we've talked in other videos about valuation, yeah. and your valuation is $1 million, $2 million. Then you're taxed on million, that when you actually finally have that. that hard conversation. And that's the, that's the primary problem? Yes, it's is a huge problem. The tax problem. The tax problem. I would have thought it would have been that you develop something and then you have this relational argument. That's the secondary problem. Okay. That's, but and, that's and secondary. That's not the primary. It, well, it's because what if it's here's what I find. If it's gotten to the point where there's real value attached to mm -hmm. it, probably the parties have a general. They might be. Is it twenty five or twenty seven percent? Yeah. There might be some of that, but you're not having the they huge swings of the twenty percent okay. versus eighty percent. Mm. That happens. Yeah. But it, it's that tax issue because you waited too long. People. It happens all the time. Founders are busy. Yep. Right. There's a ton to do. Yes. And you're sort of like, ah, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna take care of this equity issue. Yep. I'm gonna get it fixed. Yes. And then tomorrow comes with its own batch it's of not urgent. fires. It it's doesn't not, feel important. And it never is. Yes. Yeah. And it always gets pushed down. Hmm. And then a month passes, and six months pass, and 12 months pass. And then finally you have to go to lawyer, your lawyer hmm. and say, hey, this person owns 20% of the company, we never papered it. Hmm. Can't we just backdate it? At which point your lawyer gets shingles. So let me give you an example. And this happens all the time. You know, we have a situation where three founders. So it's you, mm -hmm. it's Steven, mm -hmm. and it's Jane. Mm -hmm. Okay? And you guys started, and it's legit. Like, work was done. Yep. And then Steven gets married, and Steven's like, I need a day job. Mm -hmm. I'm not mad at you, Blake. Yep. I'm not mad at you, Jane. I just can't do this. So Steven leaves. Then you say, oh, we need to get the equity stuff sorted out. Yeah. But a lot happened. And there's a sense we need to get Steven to sign some documents. Right. And so everyone's kind of uncomfortable and they send me as the lawyer to talk to Steven. And my job is to go to Steven and to say, Steven, hey, you know, Blake and Jane, I hope everything's great, you know, marriage, doing day job, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, so I've got this document I'm gonna send you. Real short, real easy. Yeah. Um, if you need to get a lawyer to review it, you know, feel free, but hopefully it makes sense. Yeah. Um, but really, we just need you to make sure that, you know, we just need you to sign everything over to us to make sure the company owns yes. everything. So they can go do their thing and you can go do your thing and everybody will be happy. Yes. And Steven's like, well, okay, but you know, I own 30% of the company. Well, you know, it was early days. Yeah. And, 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 and my job is to tell you, you don't. Yeah. You don't own 30% of the company. Because you weren't there very long and, and, and. Yeah. And how does that normally go? Right. Steven never says, you're right. You know, I will sign it. it. No problem. I wasn't there long enough to earn the 30%. Yeah. It never goes that way. Yeah. Steven gives me an earful. Hmm. You know, Steven is, 
it, not only should I get my 30%, it should be 40% because yeah. it was my idea and I was the one that brought Jane into the mix and you know, Blake can be hard to work mm. with and all these sorts of things and I, I deserve it. Yes. Everybody's got their own personal narrative. Yeah. And if you don't get this stuff on paper early, you allow those personal narratives to control destiny. Yeah. And that's scary, you know, because people have a very specific sense. And I'm not even saying Stephen is wrong. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, his worldview within the facts and circumstances as he understood it. But you got to try to level set that early why do, on. Why do we delay? Why do founders typically delay? Uh, because it's hard and it's not urgent. It's a difficult, it's important. It's a difficult conversation. It's a difficult conversation. That doesn't, is not on fire right now. Yes. Yeah, I would delay that all day long. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Hmm. You know? But I think that it is one of those instances where you have to just kind of bite the bullet and just say, I'm going to have a hard conversation. Mm -hmm. You know what? I actually, I was inspired by, I read um, the Red Hot Chili Peppers uh, autobiography. Didn't know you were going that way. Yeah. That was, that was kind of a quick. That no, was kind of I know. But I remember it, it was, okay. they had to talk to one of the members of the Red Hot Chili Peppers to kick him out of the band. Oh, yeah. And they right. like held hands walking up to the door and said, this is going to be rough. And it was like a, hold your breath and we're just going to jump in and say it yeah. and say you're out. And when I read that, I remember that gave me the confidence to be like, I need to have some tough conversations. And it's like, that's what it should feel like. It's like, you just got to jump into it and work it out. Yeah. And that's, I mean, you have to jump into the, what do you call it? The dangerous waters. You have to wade into dangerous waters yeah. as a founder. You have to do yeah. that. I once um, was in an analogous situation personally where I had to have a hard conversation. Yeah. And what I did was, I'm not a gum chewer. Hmm. I bought a pack of gum on the way to the meeting and I popped in like four strips, like right hmm. at the beginning, just to keep myself busy because I didn't, I knew that I had to let this person talk mm -hmm. and I didn't want to get defensive and I knew I would. Mm -hmm. So the gum was like a way to keep my mouth busy while they spoke, while they spoke. Mm -hmm. And also a reminder to me, like when you're ready to just bite down on the gum. Oh, interesting. And so, and it worked. And that person talked for 90 minutes. I'm not kidding you. Whoa. 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. And, but it made all the difference that I let them, I mean, I basically let them exhaust themselves. Sure. And I just kept chewing my gum. Like boxing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Strip, yeah. That's really good. Strip. And by the end, I looked like, you know, I was a baseball player. Yeah. The dude, you know, <laughs> you know cheek full of chaw, but it worked. Huh. But these are hard conversations. You got to have it. And whatever it takes it you to get through it, yeah. get through it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, all right. So first off, you don't engage a lawyer. Second, uh, you don't handle IP, IP. well. Um, third is you don't define who owns what yep. early enough. Yep. Uh, do you have any others? That's or? really it. Those are the big three. Yeah, those are the big three. Mm. You know, so much of the other stuff, it's, it's a little stuff on the edges. Mm. And in fact, let me turn it around, is I say this to investors all the time. So, you know, with my practice, I'm probably two thirds company side, one third investor side. Okay. And so when investors invest in a company, they do something called due diligence. Drink. Mm -hmm. So due diligence is, they have to do a little research to make sure that the company is what the company says that it is. Mm -hmm. You know, it says it owns these things. Does it really own these things? Yeah. It says that um, these are the people that um, have stock in the company. Do these people really have stock sure. in the company and at those numbers and percentages? They just need to check that out mm -hmm. to make sure it's legitimate. And inevitably there are holes and gaps. Sure. Right. And investors get really frustrated. One of the things I say to investors is, if you find a founder with a perfectly hygienic company, you don't want to invest in that company. Hmm. They're focused on the wrong things, hmm. right? Yeah. So it's, as a founder, you're never putting out all the fires. Hmm. You're only putting out some of the fires. Yeah. So what I want to see as a lawyer is I want to see that you've got the big fires put out. Yeah. All the IP is owned by the company. So that's a big Good fire. job. Yes. Right? Equity is straight. We know who owns what, and it's all clear. These are things that are irreversible. Great, that's yes. right. But mm -hmm. you've got the commercial contract over there is a little shaky. We'll fix that. This employment agreement's mm -hmm. a little shaky. We can fix that. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of good that you weren't focused on that because I know that you've got 40 other things, you know, that are drawing mm -hmm. on your attention. And if you've been spending all your energy on having, you know, the perfect data room yes. and the perfect legal documentation, you've probably been ignoring things mm -hmm. that are much more important to your company. I'm not telling you that investors always yeah. like to hear that, sure. but I really think it's true. This is why I like you as a lawyer. Yeah. This is a, that's a rare sentiment to hear from a lawyer, mm. right? Because I think a lot of times you've yeah. been trained in like what is the right way to do something, right. but I feel like you have some level of knowledge of like this is 
Yes, this would be perfect, but we're not going for perfect. We're going for what's workable. That's exactly and I right. really appreciate that about yeah, you. Yeah, I mm. appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, Blake. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's also recognizing genotypes, mm. right? I mean, who are founders? Who are the people that are attracted to being founders? And we talk about this. Yeah. Time, you know, and the people that want to be founders are people that don't have personalities like that. Mm. Those people work at Ernst & Young. Yeah. Right. right. And, and, I'm, and I love they them. Love and the I'm balance. glad they yes. do. Right. Right. And mm. they, they're auditing the financial statements of Procter & Gamble, and that's great. Yes. But they're not, mm. you know, engaged in this kind of disruptive activity that requires just a different personality type. Mm. And those types aren't going to keep the paper mm. in the perfect order. Yes. Right. Well, hopefully that'll keep all of these founders uh, out of litigation. So hopefully. well done. Cheers. Right yes. All right. Cool. What was our last segment? We are talking about, um, oh, when to hire a lawyer. All right, um, another big question that I think a lot of founders have. Um, I think it's that we, we're a little bit afraid of like, when do we actually engage with a lawyer, mm -hmm. right? Um, a lot of times it's like, I wanna do this myself, I wanna save some money, um, and you hear about lawyers, maybe see lawyers on TV, and you're like, I don't really need, maybe you know, to be paying some hourly fee. Talk about when's the right time to bring somebody on, um, yeah, yeah, from your perspective. Totally. So. I think first of all, and you and I have talked about this a lot, there's a difference between hiring a lawyer and engaging with a lawyer. So I think that anybody and everybody should engage with a lawyer early, which mm -hmm. means to develop a friendship mm -hmm. with a lawyer. And, and lawyers are open to this? And lawyers are open to this, okay. at least the ones that do this work. Okay. Because they do this work because they love founders mm -hmm. and they want to engage with founders that way. And they also know that, you know, that's how you market. That's mm -hmm. it. It would be very easy for me as a startup company lawyer to be able to, if I could just lay back and say, uh, come talk to me after you've raised $10 million. Sure. But the problem is by the time they've raised $10 million, they probably have a relationship with another lawyer. Yeah. You can't wait for that moment. Hmm. You need to get in early when times are hard yeah. and develop the relationship in that stage. So, you know, both from a practical perspective and also just like a heart perspective, people that do this, they want to get engaged early and, and it doesn't have to be like on the clock. It doesn't hmm. have to be for money. So I would encourage founders to ask around their community, you know, who are the startup company lawyers, mm -hmm. who should they meet, you know, meet one, meet two, meet three, see who you develop a vibe with. But that doesn't mean you start paying them money immediately. Mm -hmm. You're just developing a relationship. Now I think the question becomes, how comfortable are you with legal stuff? Yeah. There are some people who are just absolutely allergic to it and terrified by it. Mm -hmm. And those people need a lawyer early. Hmm. Don't wait. That and and they make mistakes because they don't hire a lawyer because they're scared to hire a lawyer, but they don't want to deal with the legal work, so they just sort of ostrich and put their head in the sand, hmm. and the stuff just bubbles up, hmm. and it can become really difficult to unwind it and fix it. Hmm. Um, find a lawyer that you like, and find a lawyer that's going to be fair with you, economically, and get in early. Hmm. That's for those people. Yeah. Other people are much more comfortable doing legal stuff. And those would be the people that, you know, would do safes off of Y Combinator. Yeah. Like we've talked about, you know, right off the website. And those would pe be people that would use boilerplate, mm -hmm. you know, to organize their company and to get it started and work through that process. And, and when I say comfortable with legal stuff, I don't mean like they don't need to go to law school. Yeah. They just, it, it, it doesn't scare them in sort of an existential way. They're like, I can do this. Like yeah. I do anything, you know? I bought a car, I bought a house, I have a lease on a car or a lease on an apartment or, you know, I did, I, I've, I've entered into contracts before. Yes. It's just paper with words on it. I'm a human being. I can hmm. work with that. And so for those people, that's fine. Yeah. You know, use boilerplate, use Y Combinator. You've got this friend lawyer in the background that you can just sort of ask random questions to if you need to, not pay him anything. Yeah. Um, keep that person in the mix and traverse along. And then eventually there will come a point where you will know it when you see it. Yeah. You know? And we've mentioned that a couple of times in some of these videos where it's not, it's not even a controversial issue. You will just say, this has gotten out beyond, I'm out over my skis at this point. We're getting point. into custom stuff. We're getting into custom stuff yeah. or more elaborate stuff where mm -hmm. I need a law firm behind me mm -hmm. and I can't just do it on my own. And maybe you're serious A. Yeah. You know, when you're raising money for the first time in a real way. Yeah. Um, but you can go a long ways by yourself if you're comfortable with that. Yeah. And with the tools that are out there and platforms that are out there, it's very doable. Hmm. 
typically what do you see as like that, that kicking off point where it's like, okay, now I need to start paying real dollars to a lawyer. Um, if you're if you're somebody yeah. who doesn't mind getting their hands a little dirty with some yep. work. So patents. Patents. Yeah, patents you're not doing one. your own patent. You're not doing your own oh patents. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you want to file, you know, what's called a provisional patent, which mm -hmm. is sort of a placeholder, you can do it, but even that's not ideal. Yeah. You know, I would So specialized stuff like that. What yes. about like con sometimes contracts? It sometimes seems like? contracts, you know. Like it, between you and another company? You and another company. And and again, that might be a place where I there have been plenty of occasions where I've had clients, we're friends, we're developing a relationship, they're kind of a do-it-yourself kind mm -hmm. of person, you know, they've done a boilerplate or something like that to get organized, they're moving ahead, and they're like, David, this all makes sense, but can you look at this one provision? I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'll probably do it for free. Yeah. It's 10 minutes of my time, super easy. Sure. I don't mind. Um, that's, that's why it's good to have a friend. Yeah. You know, who's a lawyer. And... And again, you can kind of continue to develop that relationship, and I'm going to do it because I feel like, A, I like you, and B, yeah. I'm endearing myself to you and sort of embedding sure. myself in your process. And you're playing the long game. I'm yeah. playing the long game. And at some point in time, there's going to be something that's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And usually it is a big financing. Yeah. Usually it's when you raise a whole bunch of money and then something sure. needs to happen. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. It unfolds, but I think the... You know, one of the reasons why you wanted to start these talks, which is, you know, we've talked about this a lot, is that, you know, there's a relationship with the founder, with investors, which is really important. Yes. And there's also the relationship with the attorney mm -hmm. that's important. And it's important for founders to not be afraid of their lawyer or to think of that as like a bad thing. Yeah. You make it a good thing. Yes. You know, and in terms of helping you sort of think through things. Now, one... One piece to keep in mind, you know, and this was a, this is sort of an interesting piece to talk about. Um, and Silicon Valley, the show, like so many things, you yes. know, illustrates this really well. Yeah. But remember, the lawyer represents the company and not you. Yes. And that's kind of a weird thing. It is. You know, for founders, and particularly when, if there's a moment where there's a break. Yes. I just remember that scene in Silicon Valley where that like total. Oh, I you love know, that guy. That guy yeah. who just, he played that role so perfectly. Yeah. I, think, I feel like I've worked with that guy several yeah. times um, with the guitar on the wall and the yeah. whole thing. Thinks that he's cool, but it's like, you're it's just a great. lawyer, man. Yeah. I mean, what are you trying to do? <laughs> who are you trying to fool? Um, but he, you know, he's in that room and, and the Mark Zuckerberg character basically walks in. He's like, you're my lawyer. Yeah. He's like, no, I'm Company the company's lawyer. lawyer. Yeah. And you're fired. Yeah. Right. And that's a really weird place. Yeah. It doesn't come up very often, you know, 9,999 times out of 10,000, founder and company, They're totally aligned, totally aligned. founder yep. talking to lawyer, totally aligned. Yep. I've worked with plenty of companies where this was never an issue, never even close to an issue ever. Yes. Most of the time that's the case, but there are these the rare outliers where things get sideways and it does become an issue and you as, and frankly as a founder need to be sensitive to that. Sure. And hopefully your lawyer is too, and giving you a bit of a heads up. They're like, hey, this is coming down the pike, and yes. you know, I still want to help manage this, and, but keep in mind, my yep. client, to whom I, own, I owe ethical responsibilities, yes. is the company. Yep. You know? It's pretty rare, I think, it's only when there's a cleavage, when it's you're actually when leaving. Yeah, and so I, in my instance, like when we started to sell Cladwell, I did. I actually had a moment where I was like, oh, I need to hire somebody who represents just me as an individual. That's right. um, and that was the first time that I, but I could sense that kind of happening. And that's yeah. very jarring um, to it's the weird. organization. It's jarring to everybody yeah. when suddenly those, that does happen. And I hate it. Um, I yeah. hate it. And, and I try to push it off as long as I can. You know, I'm saying that I need to be careful with my the partners that do the, <laughs> that run our, sure. uh, our ethics at the firms. They're like, whoa, David, no, no, you got to yeah. be clear about that. Of course we're clear about it. Yeah. Pretty much it's only when the founder's yeah. leaving the company yeah. that suddenly that becomes real. Otherwise, I, I do, I, I think I agree with you, 99% of the time, the relationship between the founder and the lawyer, that is a very unique thing where you can speak freely, um, except for the issue of leaving the company. Yeah. And that's the one thing that you're not allowed to say. Mm -hmm. Because at the moment that you say that, you've actually, you've crossed over a barrier into now the lawyer has to protect the company and you have to protect yourself. Right. But other than that, pretty much any topic goes with a lawyer. And yeah. I think that's like, I don't know. There are a lot more topics you can't talk about with your board members, and even more topics you can't talk about with your investors, and even more topics you can't talk about with your employees. 
And that's what I think is really unique about the relationship between the fan and the lawyer, is that like you get more reality than anybody else. Yeah. Um, that's really helpful. I, I'd say, I mean, maybe beyond that would be the friend. Yeah. Right, the friend who's not a lawyer, that person who has no money in the issue. That's right. Yeah, um, and you need to have those too. Yeah, you do. Um, but I think the, the problem is that the friend doesn't have the expertise that the lawyer does. Yeah. Or the context. Yeah. And I, and I think that's right. And it, it, it does come up, that situation is hard where you have the founder who's being removed mm -hmm. against their will, which doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that every founder is scared of. Yes. You know, and it's one of those, if I had a checklist of 10 things that I know that every founder is going to want to talk about, that's one. Yeah. Actually, that's probably like three through eight. Yes. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of terror about that. Um, it doesn't happen very often. How often are we talking about? You talk about 100 startups in a year. It, one out of 100. One out of 100. Yeah. And, and you know. And it, normally what causes that? Yeah, so it, you know, the, the starting point is investors do not want to take over your company. Of course not. They do not want That's to That's why they're investors. That's why they're investors. Yeah. They, you know, if they're angels, they're busy playing golf or playing with their grandkids. Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not looking to be the CEO of an app company that they don't understand. Right. That's not what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, they may be annoying, they may try to coach too much, they may try to yeah. interfere, but they're not trying to take over your company. Yeah. VCs aren't trying to do that. You know, they're betting on you and betting on you driving this company forward. They're not, probably they've never been a CEO. Yeah. And if they have been a CEO, they know what that is and they don't want to be it again, right? right? Yep. So investors are not looking to take over your company. So when does it happen when these things become an issue? Like lots of things. Like you'd ask anybody who's been divorced and say, well, why did you get divorced? You'd say, well, it kind of was here and then like all these things happened yeah. over four years yeah. and then we ended up. And that's how it happens. Yeah. It's lots of little things that, you know, a founder who started as the CEO and they were really never gonna grow to be the CEO forever. Mm -hmm. And everyone tried to suggest you really should be the CTO Let's figure out a different way to handle that. Yeah. They resisted, they resisted. Um, then they started destroying value tied mm -hmm. to their resistance. It is, I hate to say it because I'm very founder centric in orientation, sure. but most of the time it's because of founder stubbornness that these things happen. Mm -hmm. That being said, you know, one out of three times, I, I mean, look, there are bad investors. Mm -hmm. It happens. Yeah. And I've worked with founders in situations where, you know, bad investors behaving badly do yeah. bad things, you know? Yeah. And that's, it's why you always need to be, it kind of goes to something we've been talking a lot, a lot uh, uh, talking about a lot, Blake, which is you just did this because you want to solve a problem. Yeah. And now you've got to like, yeah, a business problem or, yes. a, or a technology problem. Yeah. And now you've got to figure out 20,000 things. Well, yes. one of the things you've got to figure out is relationships. Yes. And these are relationship issues. So if you have a bad Apple investor, you've got to make sure that you're developing other relationships to keep that person, yeah. you know, in a corner, um, if you end up in that unfortunate situation, yeah. so that they don't have the power to get you. Alternatively, if it's a situation where everyone around you is telling you you're in the wrong spot, we need to get you into a better spot. Yeah, it's hard, but try to open up and be emotionally available in that conversation yeah. because they're probably right, and you know you can mm -hmm. save yourself and save the company by showing a little bit of flexibility. Yeah. I heard somebody describe that every relationship is just a string of conversations. Hmm. There's nothing more to a relationship mm -hmm. than the words that we exchange, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so if that's the case, it's like, if you start to see the signs that every time we have a conversation, it's, it's in the negative direction, that's probably a sign that you're headed down the wrong path, yeah. right? Um, yeah. yeah, but it's, uh, that makes sense. That it's not, it's not one conversation that causes this thing. Right. It's actually, it's the accrual of those conversations over years. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. You know, and that's been my personal experience too. I mean, I've had, you know, just outside of providing advice, you know, both professionally and personally, there's not, it's not one conversation. No. It's not like this relationship was rock solid. And I said one wrong thing on a right. Tuesday right. and boom, yes. you know, irrevocably broken. Hmm. No, it just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Hmm. But you know, one of the themes we keep getting back to, it's interesting because you know, you talk to lawyers because you want the technical details to be right. Yes. But in any, you tell me any legal conversation, and if you talk with someone who's done this for any length of time, eventually that technical conversation is going to work into a relationship conversation. Yes. 
it is all about the relationships. Yep. All about the relationships. Yes. You know, and managing that. And it is it, one of, <laughs> it, 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 this is something I say when I'm training young lawyers, you know, people on my team all the time. Yeah. Which is, here's a big, like, beware of. When I have a client, you know, Blake, you call me mm -hmm. and say, I want to do a deal with this person. These are the terms. And by the way, I don't trust them. Yeah. So make the contract work so that it protects me from that. You're like, whoa, I do. whoa, whoa. Like, no, problem. we can't yes. do that. If yeah. There's no, if you don't trust them, you shouldn't do the deal. Yeah. There, you can't contract. I can help minimize or limit. Yeah. But anybody with enough motivation and money, yes. you know, can penetrate anything. Hmm. It's the relationships, hmm. you know, the legal stuff helps. It defines, it forces definitions yeah. and precision around who has it only what where. Works. It only works as good as the relationships are. It only are. works as good as the relationships. That's a really big, yeah. that's so, it's funny though, because people are going to you like you're a mechanic. Right. And then you're saying, how's your relationship with your wife? And, you're, and they don't want like, to talk about what? it. Right. Why are you asking me that? Right. right. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. But no, that's totally true, which is that in a good relationship, you never have to fall back on the legal exactly. structure. That's right. Yeah. That's or right. the legal structure just goes in harmony with it. That's right. It's, or the, it, yeah. it helps to, what it does is it, it, ideally it should facilitate a conversation that you yeah. should be having. And we're sort of trained professionals to help make sure that, you know, the right decisions get made in the right places to sort of head off yeah. potential issues. But what we're never going to solve is a toxic relationship. Yes. It's almost like I, I see this analogy of like it, the ideal relationship between a startup and a lawyer is that you're together laying bricks behind you. You're paving the way behind you. Mm. And I think sometimes we look to the lawyer to be paving walls on either side of us to keep us in bound and bound. It's That's like, no, metaphor. you actually need to be walking the same direction. And then we're going to just officiate it behind you. Yeah. But if you're looking to the lawyer to try to contain the direction that you're going, you're in trouble because yeah. you have to actually have a mutually agreed to direction you're walking. That's right. That's really interesting. Yeah. Hmm. I don't but know the, how relation, got, yeah. the relationship piece is, is key. And I think that's, you know, from the perspective of founders, I don't talk to, and, and why would you? I mean, I've, I'm 50 years old. I've been doing it for 25 years. And, yeah. I, and, I, and it's only relatively recently that through all that experience that I've really discovered this and hmm. sort of been able to peel it back and get to it at its core. But a first time founder, you know, whether you're 21 or whether you're 61, there's no reason for you to naturally know this or think this or understand it. Mm. Um, but it's the relationship piece first and foremost, that's the mm. game you're in. It's the only way it works and you have to think about it that way. Mm. Because if you don't, boy. It just costs a lot. It costs, yeah. well, it's, and it's trouble. Mm. You know, you're gonna have a, you're gonna have a, a bad culture. Mm. Um, you're gonna have, a lot of difficulty in raising money. You're gonna have stressed relationships with the people from whom you raise money. And then when you think about vendors and customers and other folks like that, it's just always gonna be strained. Hmm. Yeah. And that comes easy to some people and it comes hard to others. Sure. Yeah, and it's probably 50-50 with founders. It's probably 50-50. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, some really are better at it than others. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we Is all have our gifts and we all have, you know, our deficits. Yes. And circling back, I think that's why it's important to engage somebody like you early. Um, right, because you actually, you have that context and you can kind of see that kind of all around. Um, and I feel like that really, um, I don't know, I, I think that it helps us kind of uh, avoid some of these pitfalls early on, so. Yeah, to help with that. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, it, it, it's that difference between knowledge and wisdom. Yeah. Right? Yes, you and know about it or you know how to apply it. Or you know how to apply mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. you know, wisdom comes over time and just seeing things and saying, look, you might want to have a conversation with that person. Yeah. Because if you have that conversation now, you know, which was just an argument about who's emptying the dishwasher. Yeah. You know, if you don't have it now, you're probably getting divorced in 18 months. Yeah. So have the dishwasher conversation today. Wow. Right. Mm -hmm. Easy. Five minutes, done. Yes. You let it fester. Yeah. You know, it gets nasty. That's good. Yeah, I think that really, that illustrates, I know that was, we kind of took a divergent path on that, but I feel like that illustrates really well, like why you when and why to engage with somebody like you right. uh, earlier on. So, yep. well done. Not bad. Cheers. Not bad at all. Yeah. Thanks for the